Our guest today was appointed commissioner of the Department of Buildings by Mayor Daley in February of 2003. Prior to that, our guest today served two years as Deputy Chief of Staff in the Mayor's Office. She is an attorney and has practiced law in Chicago for 20 years. Our guest today received a bachelor's degree in government and her law degree from the University of Notre Dame. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the City Club of Chicago, Building Commissioner for the City of Chicago, Norma Reyes. Commissioner. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Jay. And uh, I really want to uh, take the time also to acknowledge uh, Jim Riley, who's here from the Department of Administrative Hearings. Jim, thank you for coming. I want to thank the City Club for inviting me here this morning, and thanks to all of you for getting up early. Uh, I know I could not fill the room like Rosie Andalino, um, but I appreciate all you being here. As many of you know, in January of 2003, I was named Building Commissioner by Mayor Richard M. Daley. And on March 5th, 2003, I was confirmed. I stand before you today privileged to serve the mayor and the citizens of the city of Chicago. And I'm gonna try to take some advice that the mayor gave me the day he appointed me. Norma, keep it simple. In March of 2003, I began touring the 50 wards that make up the city of Chicago. By June of 2003, I finished touring 20 out of those 50 wards. During some of those tours, I saw a building that caused me great angst. I went back to my office and I did some research on that building. I decided to take the chiefs, the supervisors, and the department deputies to some of the areas that I had visited. These were areas that I, as building commissioner, found most troubling and took them to this building in particular that I could not get out of my mind. I felt it was important to show the department's new management staff what I was seeing, but more importantly, to explain to them why our mission has to include vigorous enforcement of the building code. I took them to a building in the 27th Ward on Franklin Boulevard that once housed 60 plus families. The structure was built in 1925, and in its heyday, it was probably a pretty fancy place to live. It was the kind of building when you look at it, you say they just don't build them like that anymore. Now the building was dangerous and hazardous. It stood vacant and open, dilapidated, deteriorated, clear signs of squatters, illegal electrical hookups, extension cords hanging outside the windows, entering into one unit and through another. I asked the question, what enforcement, I asked my staff uh, on the bus that we were on, what enforcement action should we take? What enforcement action should be taken? I received a variety of responses, but the most common was, take it to court. I then pulled out the summary of the court history of this building which showed that this building had been in court for the past 17 years, changing hands from owner to owner. In fact, when this case was originally brought to housing court, the building was occupied in deplorable condition. While the case was in court, I mean, think about this, while the case was in court, the building went from being occupied to being unoccupied. The building continued to deteriorate and eventually was vacated by court order. Now the building stood open and virtually vacant. It was now a place where crime flourished, where gang members sold drugs, where you could find shooting galleries and vacant apartments, and a place where the homeless found or, or sought shelter. I asked, how could this building and its owners be the subject of a regulatory enforcement action in housing court for 17 years, and yet the structure and the physical condition of the building worsens instead of improves. Chicagoans expect and deserve buildings to be affordable, healthy, safe, 
and to provide access to people with disabilities. Further, they expect buildings to be designed and constructed with appropriate materials and by competent people. To this end, I want to assure you that the Department of Building works closely with the Department of Housing to understand our role in affordable housing. We worked with the Department of Health on lead abatement issues. We work with the Department of Environment on energy issues. And we work with the mayor's office. Uh, some developers don't like this, but we do work with the mayor's office on the greening of Chicago. One of the uh, regulatory partnerships that I'm most excited about is our, is our work with the mayor's office of people with disability. MOPD has provided extensive training to our inspection staff to ensure that the city's accessibility ordinances are complied with. As I said, I wanted to talk to you about regulatory enforcement, our changing enforcement philosophy at the Department of Buildings. The department's regulatory role and how we're working towards accomplishing our mission of vigorous enforcement through partnerships and use of technology. There are constitutional scholars out there and believe it or not, there are regulatory scholars out there. And according to Peter May, a political science professor at the University of Washington, and Raymond Burry, chairman of Urban and Public Affairs at the University of New Orleans, there are basically three regulatory, uh, regulatory enforcement philosophies, strict, creative, and accommodative. I embrace all three. What is our goal as regulators? Compliance. We want compliance. That means that we are meeting our objective. We are making Chicago a safe place to build, work, and play. How do we get landlords making, excuse me, how do we get landlords, individuals, management companies, and the construction industry to comply? Certainly not by having a case in court for 17 years. Compliance occurs when there is consistency in inspection practices. Consistency in practices occurs through setting and sharing inspection standards and the continual training of inspectors. Compliance is achieved when there is frequency and thoroughness in inspections. Compliance is achieved when there is a likelihood of meaningful sanctions. Compliance is achieved when there are shared expectations of compliance by the regulator and the industry being regulated. Compliance is achieved through education and public awareness. Information must get into the hands both of, uh, to the provider of the service and the consumer of the service. Compliance is better achieved by a regulatory agency that uses state-of-the-art technology to reduce paperwork by using technology to increase the ability to standardize inspections as well as using this data to predict trends. Compliance is not achieved through singular effort. It does not happen on its own. Remember, it takes two to tango. Therefore, a relationship must exist between the regulator and those being regulated. Compliance is achieved when there is a commitment by the contractors, the landlords, the developers, the builders and property management companies to comply. For the bad apples, compliance is achieved only by destroying the economic benefits of noncompliance. I wholeheartedly agree with, the prof with Professors May and Burby's findings that flexibility, flexibility, agency leadership, and legal support together, all three, enhance a commitment by those who are regulated. Getting back to the question, how could this building and its owners be the subject of a regulatory enforcement action in housing court for 17 years? The structural and physical condition of the building worsens instead of improves. There's no simple answer. However, the following steps are being taken by the, by the buildings department to prevent the situation from recurring. Improved management. I'd like to introduce to you my top management team. You've already uh, were introduced to Stan Caterback. Stan, please stand. He's my first deputy. <laughs> uh, 
I would like to introduce Gladys Alcazar, Deputy of Operations and Systems. <laughs> Bill Rooney, Deputy of Inspections. <laughs> Our Managing Deputy Chris Kozicki uh, cannot be here because he has the flu and three little kids. Uh, and last but not least, I'd like to introduce to you my assistant, my executive assistant, who's been with me for 14 years, Bernadette Bailey. You don't have to stand. She has a torn AC call. We have together implemented operational changes in this past year. We are reprioritizing our work. We've, ha we've added experienced investigators to our staff, not inspectors, although we have added inspectors, investigators to investigate contractors, developers, and landlords. We have cross-trained all demolition and conservation inspectors. We have added a second shift of inspectors. We are in the process of standardizing all inspections. Believe it or not, regulatory enforcement can be business friendly. As part of our stepped up campaign, Buildings has instituted a new standard procedure for annual inspections of public places of amusement. We have conducted over 300 of these inspections using a new criteria in conformance with ordinance requirements. We call the business owner, we send them a letter, we make an appointment. We then go to their establishment on the day of the appointment. They are there on the day of the appointment and we inspect. Uh, we then send them a letter telling them, here are the deficiencies we find. We don't haul them into court. We don't haul them into administrative hearings, not right away. We tell them, this is what you need to do. And if you do it, you're not going to see us again for a while. In addition, buildings will post its inspection, its inspection checklist on our website. We want to demystify what is an inspection. The owner should be prepared. The landlord should be prepared. The business owner should be prepared. You have an appointment. We're coming. Here's what we're going to look at. Here's what we're going to look at. It shouldn't be a mystery. Our inspections of public places of amusements are designed to bring about code compliance quickly so that hazards are eliminated before disaster strikes. This year, the department will pilot a self-certification program for annual inspections in the Central Business District. These larger buildings generally have maintenance staffs and other resources not available to small buildings. This will free up our inspection staff to be in the neighborhoods, to focus on that building that was in housing court for 17 years, to focus on those bad developers and contractors. This year, actually, I'd like to remind you that uh, the general, that general con contractors are required to obtain a license from the buildings department, which already licenses subcontractors such as plumbers, masonry workers. Licensed contractors must show proof of insurance, obtain a bond, and pay a license fee. This licensing scheme is effective March 29, 2004. Having this new ordinance in place promotes greater accountability to the citizens of Chicago. It is our goal to make sure residents find licensed contractors when hiring those who do work on their buildings. But make no mistake, while our efforts are aimed at gaining voluntary compliance, we can and will do aggressive enforcement. As my foster father, Barry McNamara, likes to call it, we're gonna, we can send the plagues uh, so uh, uh, we're still obviously going to be aggressive about what we do. And enforcement and regulatory enforcement, you should be anticipating, as I said, think about those trends. Um, through our 2003-2004 heat enforcement season, um, actually we've had approximately 13,000 complaints of uh, insufficient heat that we have inspected. But what we did is, in the summer between May, June, July, and August, we went to those buildings that had a history of noncompliance with the heat ordinance. That is a simple thing. You don't have to wait till it gets cold. You know who they are. 
So I can assure you that, it, that almost every building, and particularly these buildings, have code violations. You don't have to wait till it gets cold. So we inspected them in the summer. We brought them into the system. Those buildings that needed a general receiver, a general receiver was appointed. If we can agree, actually we even forced the sale of some of those buildings. We received substantial fines on those buildings. And I can tell you that those buildings that we targeted in the summer had heat this winter for the first time in many winters. That's how you do enforcement. That's how you do regulatory enforcement. And clearly, and this is to you, Chris, we need technology. <laughs> We really need technology. As some of you know, and you've been through the occupancy process, uh, for many years we had one person doing the occupancy in the city, occupancy placards in the city of Chicago. And occupancy uh, limits are vital safety information, as you know. Under the city ordinance now that passed in October, businesses need occupancy placards before they can renew their licenses the department is checking for these placards during their annual inspections. Well, if you have a manual system, imagine how backed up we would be. We were already backed up. So one of the first things um, I did in starting in March um, was to automate our, uh, our placard system. Now, uh, in, a, in about a three month period of time, we issued 2,000 placards, which was like tripled or quadrupled what we issued in the same period of time the prior year. An essential part, as I said, of the department's mission is a better Chicago, a better uh, built Chicago through technology. In that effort to improve communication with the inspectors in the field, we have begun making use of technology. It helps us with management, it improves accountability, and I can assure you it improves productivity. Our inspectors are currently using web-enabled phones that conveniently link them to city's permit database while out in the field. This technology allows them access to permit history while on inspection sites. The GPS technology that goes with the web-enabled phone enhances our ability as, as, as managers to monitor the workload and to allow for better assignments and emergency dispatch of inspectors. I'm almost done. <laughs> Take a breath. As I have mentioned, public information is also an important part of voluntary compliance. It is our goal to transform public awareness through community and industry efforts. Every year, the department hosts monthly landlord training workshops. Just recently, we hosted a two-day seminar for general contractors and licensed architects on certificate of occupancy, as well as training sessions for architects on calculating occupancy capacities for public places of amusement. We launched an initiative with DCAP and have made available online three designs for porches that comply with the building code Residents or builders using these designs can speed up the permitting process and ensure their porches comply with the code. All this is aimed at increasing voluntary compliance and above all, safety. We want people to be able to use safe structures and to use them safely that meet the city code requirements. The importance of this has been driven home by disasters as far back as the Iroquois in 1903, Our Lady of the Angels School Fire, and there's just this past year, E2, the Wrightwood Porch Collapse, and the Cook County Administration Building Fire. In closing, I look forward to finding new ways of working with you. I encourage you as business and community leaders to join us in our public safety campaign through regulatory compliance. I am convinced that the partnership, that partnership is an central prerequisite for achieving the department's compliance goals. We need to reinforce to the public the importance of maintaining our buildings and the consequences of neglecting them. Thank you.
Good morning, Commissioner. Mine is actually not a question, but a compliment. I rep I'm sorry. My name is. My name. Is, I wanted to avoid that. Uh, Good morning, name, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, my name is Graham Grady, and um, Norma, I want to congratulate you and commend you on the fantastic job that you've done there. I, uh, I represent a lot of building owners now that I'm in the private sector, and um, some of the situations have been quite, quite difficult and quite tense. Your staff has always approached it with openness and creativity, a willingness to listen and an opportunity to give someone enough rope to either solve their problem or hang themselves. <laughs> and and I, I really appreciate that. And uh, it's led to a lot of good solutions uh, through a more of a um, negotiated uh, resolution as opposed to a, um, a one of um, strict advocacy and opposition. So I, I really want to commend you and wish you all the best for uh, the continuance of your many innovative uh, solutions. Thank you, Graham. Commissioner, my name is Joel Cohen. I'd like to compliment you on your forward thinking. I was just, it just occurred to me, going forward, do you ever think about possibly some elected office? Absolutely not. I can promise you that. Good morning, Alderman. Good morning. I'm Alderman Manny Flores, and I represent the First Ward. And um, it's not a question. This is just a compliment to you, Commissioner. I'm a freshman Alderman. I've been an Alderman for almost a year now. And uh, we had a lot of tough uh, buildings in our community. And uh, quality of life is, I think, all of our goal to improve it. And I just want to commend you for your assistance, your staff, very professional. And I truly um, appreciate the First Ward, appreciates all of your hard work. So thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Alderman. Any more accolades? <laughs> <laughs> Let's give her a big round of applause.